the experience complete uh, is the formal um, proceeding of our age. Um, otherwise, it feels very informal without the uh, mask. Uh, in the movie Arrival, um, there are people who look at the message uh, as a language or a tool, but there are also people who look at the message um, as a weapon. Indeed, this shows to me that uh, it's entirely in our minds how we apply technology. Technology is never neutral. It takes on the value of the person perceiving it. And so the technology that is language, and as shown in the movie by the emoji, like paintings, is open to interpretation. And I like movies that shows this deep connection between interpretations and our different but still shared realities. Also, I like Ted Jung anyway, the novelist. So always happy to see a movie adaptation of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite science fiction authors. Um, I saw it in a uh, movie theater. Yes, I've also uh, watched and liked Interstellar, uh, and the uh, movie theater that I uh, watched was uh, for the IMAX, that is to say even with the water sprays um, and so on, which makes it a immersive uh, augmented reality experience. I totally um, agree that those phantoms do not usually assert themselves as beings or as people but the technology that uh, makes such augmented realities possible also can represent uh, these beings uh, as individuals as they are. I think computer, um, of course, have um, Buddha nature. Um, that is to say, it has its inherent logic um, of interacting with the world. Um, I would also say that bicycles combines our natures of walking to the idea of assistive intelligence. So I think bike is um, still very close to nature, certainly more than cars. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, in, <coughs> in Taiwan, 
uh, we have repurposed uh, existing roads as well as paved new roads so that um, a, <coughs> a biker can uh, surround the island much more easily. Well, we are connected by broadband, but yes, uh, I feel too. Yes, because if you move too quickly, uh, the city becomes uh, topological. That is to say, between points to connected points. But bicycles uh, are spatial. That is to say, it relates to space, not just to the connectivity. Yes, um, I would also say that we have uh, experience of this kind of the second uh, reality or the second uh, nature already uh, when we um, first invented as a human civilization the written language. Uh, it has a very similar effect on people's mind. First of all, I have yet to see the character. There are like 10 different words in my mind that can mean border. Mm hmm Ah, okay. Right, yes. Uh-huh. So... Um, this character, right, um, this, uh-huh, okay, um, to me, uh, this, uh, word, um, bo border is maybe very far <laughs> from, uh, its core meaning, um, in, in, uh, the Mandarin, uh, interpretation of the same kanji character um, in the uh, Mandarin uh, use, um, it is also mean to mean a um, circumstance and or even a condition. Uh, like w like we will say shun uh, jing or ni jing. That is to say, a condition that is progressing well or the condition that is going backwards. Um, 
we will also uh, make it to mean um, a level like um, 学无止境, uh, we, we learn with no stopping level, with no top level, no ceiling level. Um, so to, to me, um, I think this describes the idea, uh, that word describes the idea that uh, we are not uh, individuals um, in siloed bodies, that most of our body are actually a shared human condition, a shared environmental level, um, and it is actually in this shared body, you can call it body politic, body social, or body environmental, um, that we um, inhabit. And, but just like a person need to go through individuation in order to make their unique contribution to the body politic, uh, one also need to uh, look at the shared condition and maybe draw borders and boundaries to delineate where are you going to make the contribution. But that perspective, that individuation came later and once we make this contribution, we are at peace and we can go back to the feeling of sharing the same level uh, of the situation that is shared across different um, cultures. Um, and so uh, I think of um, the character that you chose as um, midway between drawing zero, like the moon um, that is half full and half um, dark and then but once you complete the full circle you go back to the shared uh, body Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, um, it is nowadays part of the formality uh, to um, put the boa border uh, between oneself and other people's respiratory systems, or even put a border between our own face and our own unwashed hands. So we create a border even between our own body parts, between our hands, which may carry the virus and our face, which would inhale the virus. And we use soap and alcohol sanitizers. But once we do so and clean our hands, we can then take off the border. So it shows that border is something that we maintain by ourselves. It is not something that is outside uh, of our own selves. It too is a technology. If I choose one, 
the kanji would look like this. Uh, and a numeral, um, for Arabic numeral, would look like this. And so it would be two different symbols. But zero, if you rotate it by 90 degree, it's the same word. Well, it's um, isomorphic up to rotation, meaning that it stays the same no matter how you rotate it. No, not yet. So, <coughs> you can just tell me which video that you want me to look at. I have it downloaded here. So just tell me the like V1, V2, V4 or something. Ah, it's not a video. Okay. It's okay, we can imagine. But our imagination will be different. Ah, here we go. Yes, I can see now. Uh, it's like a um, motherboard. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, yes. Um, I have in my tablet here the National Palace Museum. Uh, you can see a few of its most celebrated um, items and in both the version that is high resolution and the version in Animal Crossing. We see many people taking these ancient or very memorable cultural items and appreciate them together by scanning the Animal Crossing Q 
QR code. So um, I think this is a good approximation of what the mirror looks like when the analog is mirrored into the digital it enabled remixes at no marginal cost so in a sense in Mandarin here when we say digital or shu wei that word also means plural as in many so shu wei zheng wei the digital minister can also mean the plural minister, many, many ministers. So um, in my mind, it is not so much as one is the duo or is the um, exact of copy of the other as we would uh, for traditional mirrors, like glass mirrors. But rather, this mirror is more like a kaleidoscope uh, it's mirrors within mirrors, and each person can remix the digital versions to construct their realities. So the questions become, do we want virtual realities where people are isolated from one another? Or do we want shared realities that connects people together, even when they have the option to remain isolated, they choose not to do so? and share their realities in a much more easy way because the reality capturing technology as evidenced by the five cameras looking at me right now, six cameras looking at me right now, is also being democratized. Definitely. Um, so uh, this is me uh, scanned four years ago. 
um, situated against the space, probably. Uh, um, and this reflects the idea that reality uh, is just a window. And of course, there are different realities, um, even from a single person's perspective. But as you mentioned, the physical constraints of the acoustic attenuation of the optics reflection often constrain our imagination of the possible realities to look from. And in this sense, a 3D scan of our surface, uh, not our mind yet, that will come later, um, can provide a liberating experience because our digital double, our digital twin, um, can be pluralized and explore simultaneously different configurations of physics. Yes, um, it's not even the future. Uh, I read last week that some uh, engineers uh, at a University College London uh, just doubled the capacity of the current internet uh, record of transmission by uh, transmitting every second around 178,000 gigabytes or almost 200 terabytes per second. Comparing to that, our reality, that is to say, the total input that our mind takes from our optical, auditory, and other sensory functions uh, in a human being is just about 17 gigabytes per second, which makes it just ten thousandths, one of the ten thousandths of what that um, Brit engineer have just made. So that single line can support ten thousand people in its realities if we take the view of the Matrix movie and the cable connector uh, behind our back. So that's high resolution. What our body offers is just good enough resolution.
Definitely. Uh, and when I say good enough, I did not mean it in a way that says, oh, you just came in, um, give your best try, even though it's just one uh, ten thousandth uh, of the fast internet connection um, is sufficient and we need to be grateful and so on. I did not mean it in that way. When I say good enough, I mean that it's precisely the kind of bandwidth that our minds can grow and individuate. Indeed, if you introduce to the mind, not even 10,000 times, 10 times the information to a human mind, one would suffer uh, from a, a schizophrenia very quickly. And so a gradual uh, incorporation of technologies that are appropriate for us is more important than adapting our mind uh, to fit the latest technology. The second way um, is madness, quite literally. Yes, I am taking a look. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I have the same uh, frames uh, on my 
from here. Yeah, I don't have a habit of making conversation when watching a movie. Usually, if you do so in a movie theater, the people who are sitting around you may tell you to be quiet. Old habits die hard. So even though now the director is saying, hey, say whatever come to your mind when watching a movie, I have yet to build that habit. Yes, um, it is stuck uh, in my mind uh, the words um, adornment. What a science! Um, because uh, the quote was not complete uh, in the uh, film, there is a, a third line that is not quoted. I believe it was uh, modesty. What elegance. Because if you, if you only look at the two lines that was quoted, it's quite superficial. It talks about the outside, how one need to dress up and be beautiful. But the punchline, literally, uh, from Coco Chanel, was in the inside, the power of modesty, of humility, of listening. Uh, and that is what made the adornment and the beauty work together. Otherwise, it would be not a science, but rather a pseudoscience where one would conform to the fashion statements instead of radiating one's elegance as amplified. If you start with something that is empty, if you amplify it, it's still empty. But if you start with something that is modest, then when you amplify it, <coughs> you get elegance. So what is not in the film is what's in my mind. <coughs> No, it's fine. Uh, I mean, <coughs> the film director, <coughs> what to cut is more important than what actually gets filmed. So by cutting that part, um, I feel that um, the main message has been one of a uh, democratization of fashion, a democratization of perfumes and so on. <coughs> but uh, just as the suffragists the people who uh, fought for voting, <coughs> I mean, for the society at the time. <coughs> While, of course, it's important to fight, to go to the street, and so on. What is important and elegant is actually the act of voting itself. So when there is um, a gap, when there is something missing, that's where innovation uh, happens. 
the lack of a voting right、uh, compelled the suffragist movement, and the lack of the third line、um, would provoke、uh, my thoughts. So that's fine. I think modesty、uh, is also important. In Taiwan,、um, we are in a different reality. We had many pop stars in the recent days holding tens of thousands of people's concerts. Even、um, the tens of thousands of、uh, audience did have to wear a mask and get their temperature、uh, checked. Still, it's a very large gathering. So we are in a,、um, I guess, future spot that Japan will be、uh, one day、um, when you can freely choose between large gatherings and watching the live stream. And、uh, what we have seen, though, is that even though our restriction on large gatherings in Taiwan only held for a couple months. It really reduced people's vanity. People do not post a lot of Instagram photos of them looking in a higher status than other people. That's considered of questionable taste when so many people are suffering. And so modesty is definitely becoming.、Um, A dominant aesthetics value in the post-COVID world, so that even if people can now show up to large gatherings, they tend not to dress with extravaganza. That's definitely the case we're seeing in Taiwan.
Um, so this is a uh, really large topic. We can have a three-day seminar uh, around um, how conviviality uh, grows from the environment of um, wabi-sabi. Uh, that's another Japanese idea. Um, but to me, um, what really is important about the COVID is not the urban slash rural relationship. It is the inter um, national, um, for lack of a better word, um, or better, I think, transcultural um, environment that we are in. Because previously, when we worked on, for example, disinformation, um, that crisis feels more acute the younger and newer the democracy is. So Taiwan feels it more than Japan does. Or when we talk about climate change, islands like Taiwan and Japan feels it more than continental um, habitats. But pandemic is the first in our lifetime topic that there is no difference in urgency. It's equally urgent everywhere on the planet except maybe Antarctica. Um, and so people come together to celebrate this moment of conviviality online as kind of an escape from the physical space that poses real danger to our bodies. And so the reality that we escape to is for the first time equally populated by people around the world in various different time zones. Nowadays, I wake up early to have conversation with North and South American friends. I go online after dinner to meet with European and African friends. So never have I felt that I live in so many time zones. That is a kind of conviviality that I think is notably shaping the world. And we will not forget this feeling of transcultural solidarity, even after vaccines are developed. Well, a few things. First of all, Taiwan is not just one culture. When I talk about transculturalism, I refer to my own experience of right before dropping out of junior high school when I was 15 years old. I spent quite a few um, time in uh, the Atayalde, uh, indigenous uh, nation, uh, and also uh, for example, the Amis nation, uh, which is a matriarchy, 
um, the Taiwan Nation, uh, which I think President Tsai Ing-wen uh, shares part of the lineage from, um, was not uh, particularly patriarchal or matriarchal. Um, gender is <coughs> not very important, um, not as important as other um, characteristics. And so by virtue of having so many different um, cultures in the same island, and a very densely populated uh, island at that, it creates a, a tension that can only be resolved by just like the Jade Mountain uh, growing upward, transcending um, existing categories so that it would make sense uh, for all the cultures uh, involved. And so in the past 12 years, we've been doing exactly that in the uh, public sector with the Gender Equality Committee, which is by design uh, one more vote from the civil society. The social sector has eight, 18 seats, where um, the public sector have 17 ministers. Uh, and for each and every government project um, or budget items or new bill proposals coming from the administration, the Gender Equality Commission do a comprehensive impact assessment. So at the end, we collect many, many items on what we call the Gender Impact Assessment Dashboard. Um, and so we have a uh, mirror, a reflection of each and every policy's gender impact on the society, even long after the policy um, have finished. And I think that is uh, really the um, inner supporting structure that may sure that even for public servants working on financial policy or, or on immigration policy, that they would not list gender as the top item to evaluate, they have to do so anyway. And it's quite unique. We don't do that for um, other issues. Well, this year we added cybersecurity as the second assessment issue. But before, <laughs> um, gender was the only uh, kind of cross-cutting uh, social sector review mechanism that we have in place. Um, and so I think it reveals a deep commitment in the public sector not to make progress based on any dominant culture, male or otherwise, but rather uh, to be transcultural in a sense of making the balance itself an innovation that can deliver on those common values as our priority. So not male dominating or female dominating, not left wing or right wing, uh, but rather up wing. Um, I think that is a public administration answer, uh, but that is very exportable um, across the region, I believe. I would say that during the COVID-19, uh, because the virus doesn't care about your gender, um, one uh, is, as you just mentioned a segment ago, uh, instead of fitting into societal stereotypes or fashion statements, uh, one would just dress and wear whatever that um, makes one comfortable uh, in this uncomfortable time. Uh, and um, pink medical masks, as you probably already know, became uh, very hip among uh, school age boys um, because of a um, pink, pink panther incident uh, that the commander Chen Shizhong, the minister, said that it was his uh, favorite childhood hero. Um, and um, I would say that it became much more fluid. Uh, people understand that we have much more unifying characteristics with each other, namely the vulnerability to virus, um, than any categories uh, or binary stereotypes. So I would definitely say that plurality grew uh, in Taiwan um, during the COVID pandemic even more. Uh, so it served as a accelerator, just as it served as an accelerator in digital transformation.
um, was it 100 years already? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, we're still having some time uh, to realize. Uh, that thought, I believe, um, probably in the time of the Global Sustainable Goals. Um, so, um, a, a few things, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that nowadays people can discuss the concept of uh, work uh, versus labor in a much more informed way, uh, partly thanks to economists such as Keynes. Uh, we also understand that um, labor uh, must not be equal to one's self-worth. Indeed, the English word worth um, is now being evaluated from a pure economic terms as, for example, as measured by the GDP uh, to what is a more um, sustainable, that is to say longer term thinking, uh, like seven generations down the line. If you measure the worth in that time horizon, then uh, it tend to work much better across different cultures. But if you measure it only from one quarter, like the number you just showed in the video, which I believe um, Taiwan in the same quarter um, also suffered from a negative, um, but it's negative 0.73%, uh, so slightly less. But that is not um, a true reflection of the society, of the societal changes that we just talked about in the previous segment. Now we understand the worth is uh, not determined by the GDP. GDP is just one of the 169 goals of the Sustainable Development Goal targets. So maybe if we should pay attention to GDP uh, only um, 169th um, of um, fraction of one's time. So I will not spend a lot of time on GDP. Uh, but that uh, attitude is a drastic change from the um, times of Keynes. So I would say that his prediction that we're going to look past that is almost there. Uh, and we have some more, yes, a decade or so uh, to completely forget about GDP.
Um, so so. Um, as Keynes uh, pointed out um, 90 years ago, uh, he said, and I quote, um, the time for all this is not yet. For at least another hundred years, we must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair. For foul is useful and fair is not. And so everyone's earthly and so on, um, they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into daylight. And so we need to work on it for the next 10 years so that the necessity uh, would be behind us and that we can drop the pretense. Uh, 90 years ago, King said that the necessity was that that avarice, usury, and so on, uh, they must be used as a vice. We understand as a vice, <coughs> but, quote, um, they must be our gods for a little longer skid still, unquote. That is to say, one need at that time to look into these vices as a necessity to get out of the economic recession. And what we are looking nowadays is that people no longer hail them as gods, or if some people still are, at least they're just a minor god in a large pantheon of values. And so the necessity is almost behind us to uh, put avarice and ursary on a pedestal. Um, and what I'm referring to is that the necessity could be over in 10 years if we meet the global goals. Or it could be a little longer. As Ken said, you know, he said at least another 100 years. He didn't say exactly 100 years. So it's all up to us uh, to reach the goals together. Indeed, um, when you have a linear economy, exploitation must happen somewhere. The difference is just you're aware of it. I mean, if you're um, externalized, it's so much that we're not aware of it. But when the economy becomes circular, uh, then uh, there is no need uh, for the exploitation or the aggressiveness that we have seen uh, in the previous economic paradigms. That's why circular economy has been the national priority for the past four years and for the foreseeable future in Taiwan.
Um, I like the cover. The <coughs> the cover to me, um, it twists the idea of a barcode, which is really a very dull but useful technology, into a horizon, and radiating, exploring uh, different possibilities. It shows to me like a beginning of the um, double diamond design idea that's from IDEO um, where you start from a place of great um, uncertainty by exploring all the different possible futures uh, and then at some point once you discovered the um, I wouldn't say totality but uh, the majority of what people's uh, fears and hopes are then one can then work to define the common values. And that's uh, what radical markets feels to me, that we're still in the exploration phase, in the discover phase. So I wouldn't say that I agree with any particular proposal, even though I tried quite a few of them in uh, my work as a civic technologist and in my work as digital minister, such as quadratic voting. Um, but we are not saying that each particular line is what we're committed to because otherwise it would just be like barcodes uh, what we're saying is that we are um, in agreement of the feeling that democracy itself is a applied technology of applied social sciences uh, and just like any technology it's better if it's appropriate and if it's appropriated uh, by the people um, to fit their needs to explore the possibilities I think Many people feel that democracy um, was a old technology that has already well passed the definition stage and is now well into the uh, development and delivery. But to me, democracy is just at the very beginning, whereas we're still exploring its possibilities. So that's the part I like about the book, it's in the cover.
Yeah, um, I totally um, agree that we need to uh, look beyond this um, fiction of Double Diamond and open up the possibilities uh, at the end. Because when there's no marginal cost um, upon the delivery, we can then look into various different cultures that sprung from the delivery part. It used to be that the delivery parts are mutually exclusive in a physical space. If you deliver one design, that's to the exclusion of the other design. But in a digital space, um, as you just mentioned, um, the delivery of one is just the beginning of another remix. Um, and so opening up uh, the final point of the second diamond, I think to me is what summons to my mind um, the cover uh, picture of Radical Markets. Well, um, the easiest way for uh, dialogue to happen and for people of very different cultures to uh, listen to you uh, is great food, uh, drinks, music, um, conviviality. Um, and that is not only software-defined. I'm sure you can do software-defined food recipes. <laughs> uh, but it's also um, co-created. And the co-creation is the most important. Uh, when we're in the social innovation lab where I work, we have lunch um, every Wednesday. Uh, we meet for dinner um, very frequently. And people of various different cultures and different generations, people who are 70 years old, um, 80 years old, uh, frequent a place because they know that they can also bring their wisdom in the form of a recipe or of a dish that they just cooked. Um, and so in that sense, the product need not to be precisely defined. I mean the food um, need not be pre precisely defined because it's just an excuse for people to meet each other and enjoy. So when people take enjoyment in each other's presence, instead of putting the object, that is to say the product, um, as the main thing. We're really just having fun. And this object is just one of the myriad of ways for us to have fun together. And in this way, um, the brief could be ripped. Because ripping the brief, meaning to uh, do away with all the preconceptions or putting into the bracket, as it were, is to contextualize it alongside many other possibilities 
This is not saying that this hardware maker need to forget about hardware. It's just putting their hardware next to many other wares. Um, it could be silverware. <laughs> Um, and may, may, maybe um, that we can then look at these objects as the social objects as they are, instead of as the goals uh, that constrains um, our thought. And suddenly, when it's made for sharing, then people would be able then to listen to other people's voices more. When it's not made for sharing, but rather made for sales, for um, one-time consumption, then of course the transaction, if you're buying something, a hardware product, there's not enough amount of information from you to the makers to inform this kind of communication. So increasing the bit rate is very important. Just as in democracy, it's not just about voting every four years, uploading three bits of information per person to the polity per four years. If we can increase the bandwidth of feedback, then ownership uh, dissipates, it becomes sharing. Uh, and the idea of products dissipates, it becomes service, and a sharing service at that. And then communication becomes very easy. So make the environment friendly, uh, convivial, um, invite the hardware people, and make sure that the hardware is part of the space, but not the center, the focus, of attention. Uh, that would be the first step that I would take. Yeah, when you talk about uh, platforms and open source, I um, recall in my mind uh, a essay uh, last century uh, in '99, written by Neil Stephenson, uh, and the title is "In the Beginning Was the Command Line." Uh, and in the essay, um, and I quote, Neil Stephenson said. Um, Linux, which is right next door, is not a business at all. 
It's a bunch of RVs, yurts, teepees, geodesic domes, set up in a field, organized by consensus. The people who live there, they are making tanks. These are not old-fashioned cast-iron Soviet tanks. They are more like the M1 tanks of the U.S. Army, made of space-age materials, jammed with sophisticated technology from one end to the other. But they are better than Army tanks. They've been modified in such a way that they never ever break down. They're light, maneuverable enough to use as ordinary streetcars and use no more fuel than a subcompact. These tanks are being cranked out on the spot at a terrific pace and a vast number of them are lined up along the edge of the road with the keys to the ignition. Anyone who wants can simply climb into one and drive it away for free. So I want to focus on the lined up along the edge of the roads with the keys in ignition. Uh, to me, that's a platform. That's what platforms are. If you go to a train platform, trains <laughs> are lining up and they're being driven away. Uh, and anyone who wants to get on a train gets on a train from a platform. So the platform, instead of holding people in as a vendor lock-in would or a ward garden would. It, it's an oxymoron to say a ward platform because a platform is for you to board the car or board the train and uh, ignite it and, and drive it away. And, and so to me, um, saying platforms that are not open, a closed platform, a ward platform, uh, that to me is a kind of fundamental oxymoron. Um, and so I think uh, what I'm uh, looking at um, in the Neil Stevenson's um, essay, uh, he has this idea that Linux will never uh, be mainstream because it is too many uh, different moving parts. But of course, my phone runs Linux. So <laughs> we know <laughs> that things have changed <laughs> in the past 20 years. Um, and I think the main idea in that essay, which is anyone can drive toward the direction however they want, and we mutually support each other, we really need to reclaim that um, semantic field in the terms such as sharing economy or platform economy. Too often, uh, sharing is um, reappropriated to mean something that is definitely not sharing, but exploitation. And platform is taken to mean something that is definitely not a platform. It's more like a merry-go-around where you never go anywhere. Um, and so reclaiming those meanings uh, is important to me. And to me, platforms are by definition open. Oh, definitely. Um, for the past couple years, in our annual presidential hackathon, instead of just a panel of judges uh, picking 20, 24 entries from more than 200 this year for the um, collaboration to coach them into trilingual, that's social, public, and private sector data collaboratives, we crowdsource the voting to the people. Anyone with an email address and an SMS number in Taiwan who participate in the join platform, which has more than half of the population um, as unique visitors, can choose which projects they want to see succeed in the presidential hackathon. And so we use the radical market idea quadratic voting. When people see a large palette of um, ideas, each one corresponding to one or more of sustainable goals, everyone can get 
into the voting um, booth. But instead of just picking the goals and the projects they like, each of them have 99 points. And they can spend it however they want. They can vote for 99 projects, each one uh, with one vote. But if they really support something, <coughs> for example, using water boxes to uh, sense the water pollutions in Taiwan, it, uh, especially around agricultural lands. They can vote two votes, not just one. But once they do, they have to spend four points in total. They can also vote three votes, but each individual voting three votes will have to spend nine points here. So this is quadratic. And with 99 points, even if I like a project very much, I cannot vote 10 votes because that would cost 100 and I do not have 100. I can only vote 9 votes. And once I do, which is 81 points, I still have 18 left. So this is a game, right? Gamified um, consensus. People can then um, be motivated to look into something else. For example, this year using distributed ledgers to track and report marine debris. And maybe it's a good idea. So I have 18 left. I will vote four votes and leave me with two points because 18 subtracting 16 is two. So I'm motivated to then look into two more ideas. And suddenly I discovered this previously not seen project. For example, the one that asks people to imagine using augmented reality. What if all the empty unused lands owned by the public sector now have trees planted in it. It's a collective game of imagining planting. It's called patch by planting. That may sound strange, but well, I have only two points left anyway, so I might as well read about it and then give them one point. But I still have one point left. So I will look into something um, nearby, and it's about drinking water. It's an app that shows a map of drinking water refill fountains uh, in the city. And if I, instead of buying plastic bottles, can just uh, take a uh, reusable bottle and refill it, it collects me points so that I can then uh, redeem it uh, in the tea serving stations and enjoy the local culture more because we get to on a local tour as uh, offered by the local um, places that offer drinking water for free. So it's a way to encourage bicycle and walking as opposed to driving in a car also. So it's reducing carbon emission both on the drinking water like less plastic waste part but also the more exploring the city by walking or bicycling part. That's such a good idea. But I still have one point left. I want to vote more than one. So maybe I take some of my uh, nine votes back Maybe I do a seven and seven. And so people are much more willing to think more deeply about the proposals as opposed to a traditional voting where you just get um, a social media call to vote for your um, friend or family member and you go there, vote everything there, and then you leave without exploring the other 200 ideas. And so most people vote more than four teams in the quadratic voting and we discover a lot of synergy between the teams because of people's strategic way of voting and because of the marginal cost of each extra vote is the same as the marginal return. People's best way to game the system is actually to learn about it and vote honestly. There's no um, way to um, game the system by pretending to vote for things that you do not truly want to see succeed. And so this is a concrete way we've been using radical markets ideas in quadratic voting for the past couple years. And the top five teams each year receive a trophy from the president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. And it's a shape of Taiwan and a projector. If you turn the projector on, it shows president handing the trophy to you. So it's a meta trophy. It describes itself. It says, whatever you did in the past three months, for example, this water refill map, we are committed to make it a reality from the president to the entire administration 
in the next year. Yeah, we have a buffer of half an hour here. You can run over by at most half an hour.
It's like having a referendum every day, isn't it? Um, used to be, um, <coughs> of course, <coughs> hard to understand, I'm sure, uh, when that appears. But uh, with quadratic voting, you can literally do a referendum every day. Uh, nowadays, we have the technology to think about such possibilities. Uh, and it is not a very far, um, not too radical, <laughs> uh, when viewed uh, from the radical market's uh, point of view. We can easily think of referendums that are only binding for 24 hours. Uh, and then after 24 hours, people can overturn it uh, using only 20% of population. Indeed, uh, in the video game Civilization VI, Quadratic voting is exactly what's used in the Planetary Council. Uh, and so in video games as well as Ethereum, like Gitcoin, which is a very large, massive multiplayer game, um, we already see this kind of like forking uh, made possible because of the non-exclusive nature of software-based delivery. If 20% of people do not like where Ethereum is going, well, they can fork Ethereum. That's uh, already a reality. It's not a dream anymore. It's many consensus algorithms, uh, and the consensus about which consensus to use uh, is the interesting part, yes. Yeah, the, <coughs> the reason why of the absentee uh, balloting, um, we're considering it for a referendum, by the way, uh, but it's not uh, made for uh, election, uh, voting for people, um, is because the counting process in Taiwan um, is uh, a social ceremony. When you um, count the votes, the physical paper ballots, um, instead of just the people who specialize in the voting affairs, do the counting. We make sure that anyone, YouTubers, um, citizens, anyone can just go and bring their camera to the counting booth and to help ensuring that the counting is fair. And so it has been thoroughly gamified uh, as uh, a person is counting the vote 
you can see this person here that uh, holds up the vote and for the other people to count the one with the um, pink ballot and you can see people using cameras to capture that moment you can see people uh, making their own apps to do their own tallying as soon as they see this being counted you can also see that people youtubers in this case saying that in Taiwan the democracy is so important that all the youtubers should not only go out and vote but go out and broadcast the counting uh, and in this environment it is difficult for voting for absentee um, because if you are in a small island and you have absentee voting uh, then maybe people who are um, visiting that island who vote for some another island because Taiwan has many islands um, is literally the only person visiting that small island uh, at a time so when you're counting so publicly you will s say uh, oh that candidate has one vote but then that candidate from the remote um, island only has one person in visiting in this island so the origin island people looking at the public count will know for sure <laughs> that who this visitor has voted and therefore uh, compromise the anonymity of their voting but for national referendum there's no such issue because no matter where you are you are voting on exactly the same ballot so there is in our national referendum act provisions to not only do e-collecting but eventually e-counting and absentee, absentee voting and so on all these are uh, possible uh, according to authorization of the National Referendum Act. And I think once we get more comfortable uh, with that technology, we will then learn how to make improvements to the election process. But it must always maintain this extremely high degree of public accountability and participatory accountability. And so that partly also answers uh, your second question, because it's fun. It's a social ceremony is a celebration of the democracy uh, that are so young in Taiwan and that people struggled uh, for the democracy. So each voting is a celebration of the fact that we can vote uh, and a celebration that the vote means something uh, for the future generations. Um, and because of the participation, you can do the counting process, you can do the live streaming, you can do a play-by-play um, -play -play commentary, you can compare various um, television channels for the counting methods uh, and things like that. Uh, it became very participatory uh, and I think that is why. And also, uh, we vote early and we vote often um, in the primary schools. Uh, we vote already um, in, within the class. Uh, to uh, also determine the co-ops, the consumer co-ops that many people uh, remember from their primary school days um, on the precinct level, township level. There's a lot of votes. Um, when I turned 20, uh, my first vote uh, was on the local uh, district uh, head uh, and the candidate that I voted for won by one vote and that tells me voting very important because otherwise it will be up to um, rolling a die or something. Well, then we just introduce more uh, local festive uh, participatory budgeting, for one. 
um, the voting for presidential hackathon, uh, for the, on the other hand, um, there's many uh, new designs, local referendums, why not? So you can introduce many, many different ways of involving people in the voting process. Uh, and not all of it have to be equally politically binding. The e-petition, for example, only binds the administration to come out and give a well-reasoned point-by-point -point response. Um, and if it's cross-ministerial, then we also meet the, the pe petitioner. But the threshold is much lower. You only have to collect 5,000 signatures online. Um, and so just have a lot of different difficulty levels. If a game only has the hardest level, then nobody other than the most hardcore players will play. But if a game has many beginner's levels, then people who have a few seconds to spare can easily participate and regain the festivity. Making it uh, instantly gratifiable, I think, would be the key. Now, if information wants to be free, networks want to be scale-free. Um, that is to say, um, if we connect people in such a way um, as to make sure that the hubs can effectively connect through common values, and that's what hashtags are, these are common values, um, instead of by proximity, of physical location, then it became a scale-free network um, in academic terms. Um, and, and that is very important because once you have a scale-free network that can um, make sure that a complex network can nevertheless quickly find people of common value, then that common value becomes the unifying principle upon which democracy could be built that would be a, a demos, a, a crowd, right? When we say we're crowdsourcing, we're crowdfunding, we're saying we're defining through a common value, a crowd from the general population. And so the more you can do so, the more you can make democracy work in a scale-free way. The more you rely on the constraining physics and acoustics, for example, on the um, ac Acropolis of Athens, then uh, that uh, density and that crowd is probably the largest crowd that you can do uh, if you rely on non-digital ways alone.
Yes, uh, and I will show one such hub, uh, namely the GitHub. Uh, and uh, when I contributed to the Code for Japan project uh, in collaboration with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government on the Stop COVID uh, dashboard, uh, I made a small um, suggestion, uh, and it's the 827th suggestion uh, or pull request uh, from that website. And you can see that the reaction is very festive. You see a lot of people, um, actually thousands of people, um, just rallying, uh, having fun, um, clicking fireworks symbols, rocket symbols, and heart symbols um, around a, a one kanji change. Uh, and so that shows to me the kind of festivity around democracy. And, but it's also a serious meta because it shows the coronavirus and reflect the latest um, information around Tokyo to people who speak only uh, Taiwanese Mandarin. So it's at once a public sector work, but it's also a social sector celebration. And we need more of those connecting acts that connects, as you said, the two steps together. Yes, but yes, yes, but but that's what skill free means, right? The work that I contributed has been um, forked into the networks of so many different localities, and it's not just the name of the localities, but rather the group that did the forking or the uh, reimagination of their local pandemic response dashboard. So each uh, group name, each person's name here is a connector, uh, a um, hub in this uh, scale-free network. It's just one hop away from the Tokyo Metropolitan Dashboard to the Kyoto um, da Dashboard, uh, as you mentioned, um, and for um, Nara, Wakayama, um, Hiroshima, uh, Yamaguchi, <laughs> Kagawa, <laughs> and so on, I can go on, right? So, so this kind of uh, skill-free structure is what I have in mind when I said that uh, it made sense on the correct scale and these different points, just as the occupier network worldwide, each sent two delegates to two other um, occupier networks to connect, that then also becomes a polity.
Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I think if you see democracy as something that is fixed, then there is no hope because um, that is just like the laws of physics. You don't uh, wake up and say, let's have a referendum and change the speed of light. That's not something that we do. Or even if we do that, it will not be very gratifying because as to be the speed of light would not change. But uh, um, if we think democracy as just applied consensus making technology, then we can wake up and say, hey, I want to make a different kind of democracy. Uh, and lo and behold, people on GitHub or people in Animal Crossing uh, can then uh, agree uh, to agree on different ways, agree on different ways to agree, basically. Uh, and that's what radical markets and uh, associated radical exchange movement is all about. It's not some random people in, in New York, um, like Glenn Weil or Vitalik Buterin or Daniel Allen or yours truly, the board members. The, the board members doesn't really do much in the Radical Exchange Foundation other than maybe uh, choose a better font and logo and things like that. Uh, rather, we encourage the chapters, just like the uh, code for cities uh, in the uh, Japan, to imagine the kind of local governance um, principles that would work in that particular locality. Uh, and so the locality means both on a geographical sense, but also on a cultural sense. So in that sense, um, Taiwan and Japan are very close, maybe closer uh, than the physical proximity, because we share similar values of technology adapting to meet the society, rather than society chasing technology. And so the closer we are in terms of values, the easier it would be to make this kind of re new imagination of democracy as a technology, because the technology parts, like quadratic voting, we can share much more freely among people of similar values. And that is how we get people to rethink democracy as sets of technologies that you can pick and choose from, rather than uh, being set in stone. Um, so I think this is a interesting like folk craft, right? This is the idea of appropriate technology. Not only is the technology have to be appropriate to the locality, but the local people have to appropriate the technology um, to make the uniqueness uh, for that locality. Um, and I think the platforms, as long as they are open, they are, of course, uh, firmly on the side of locality because um, each pull request is a fork of what's there. And each fork reflects a locality. Indeed, when I uh, send a pull request about a language selector, it says something about people in Taiwan preferring uh, the, the kanji T uh, body with more uh, strokes than the uh, Japanese kanji uh, with very simple strokes. Um, and so I think um, each and every action of forking on the digital platform, as long as they are open, reinforces people's idea that their uniqueness from that local culture can contribute transculturally to other people's understanding. But if the platform is closed and is dominated not by the people who use the platform, but rather than the people who imagine first the platform, then to me, it's not a platform anymore. 
and therefore could of course hurt locality. But we talk about that when we discuss about platforms. So I will make the same um, suggestion. It's just to work with platformers that truly understand and make open innovations that are meant to be forked, meant to be appropriated. Yes, in 10 minutes now. Of course. Of course, you have 10 minutes? Yes. Uh, okay, I may... I, I, uh, of course, I may give silly answers, but I don't promise. Um, definitely blue. I'm sorry? Uh, blue and black. Okay, okay, okay. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm listening to the uh, Disney Plus streaming of the Hamilton. So at the moment, it's hip hop, but it may change tomorrow. Well, I wear a mask in addition to what I wear before, but it did not change uh, other parts of my wearing. I think it's even more than ties, um, because uh, it's of course similar to ties in the sense that it's part of formality, but I think a uh, mask has a much larger surface and it's in a sense uh, a second face. So um, I think it uh, is a larger palette with a larger parts of experimentation than ties are because you don't look into other people's ties all the time when you talk to them. But you have to look at their mask when you talk to them. Um, on average, maybe pi, uh, that is to say between 3 and 4. A little bit more than 3. Yeah. So to me, if I mix two kinds of tea box together, it represents a new point in time. Is like a bookmark in time. Um, and so if I want to go back to that point in time, I will mix those two flavors again. Otherwise, um, if I'm not feeling particularly bookmarking the moment, uh, I usually drink uh, simple tea bags uh, with one uh, flavor. It's Sabian's wisdom. And thank you for the great questions. Uh, and for the movies. These are really good short movies. Live long and prosper. 
委员，请问呃，今天你们两位同世代，类似同世代的人这样对谈，感想如何？嗯、呃，我觉得，因为可能我们双方的文化呃比较相近，所以虽然我们谈论的是一些很大的危机。好比像说，呃，生物学上面的就是大的流行病，或者是说，甚至人类还有没有未来等等。但是，可能因为就是不管台湾还是日本，都是一天到晚有就是呃地震啊、天灾啊，还有一些火山啊等等的事情。所以在这样的情况下，其实就算我们看到这些，乍看之下好像是人类历史上面大的断裂的这种时代，但是我们还是非常在心里有那个余裕的。会去把它当做哦，这是我们的嗯、呃，就是祖先辈已经发生过的事情，未来也还是会发生吧。那我们这一代能做什么呢？等等，这样子平常心的方法去面对。所以我觉得就比较没有说，好像年轻人大惊小怪啊、呃，或者是老年人才有智慧这样。我们都是在一个随时随地都必须要保持这种淡定的这样子一个状态里。今日はあの若者とか同世代の対談と言ってもでも主に世の中大きな事件とか環境のことを言ってまして例えば地震とか今回の病気とかこんな大きいこと言ってるのででも我若者の私にとってはこれはまあもううちの先代たちも経験してきてるし。ですので特に何か感じたわけでもないんですけど、でも若者もえこういうゆえにえ心の中に余裕を持って、じゃあこの時代に若者何ができるか思いまして、で次はえどういうふうになれていくか、でこういう世界に合わせていくかどうか思ってます。谢谢。谢谢。好。啊，这个可以。呃，有没有要给年轻人的 message？ 嗯。那就是万事万物都有缺口，缺口就是光的入口。诶，若者にメッセージで言えば、物事、この世の中に何があってもその掛け口があります。その掛け口というのは光の差し込み口でもあります。谢谢，谢谢，谢谢，谢谢，谢谢，没问题，没问题。